good good evening have a good day everybody around the globe and uh, yeah thank you very much for introducing me today i'm gonna be talking about data intensive teams uh, whatever that means hopefully we'll also uh, be able to understand it uh, so basically i'm uh, working at the olex group i'm leading search and recommendations there and olex group uh, for those of you who don't know uh this is an online marketplace that is present in more than 25 countries with more than 350 million monthly active users uh the biggest company they uh that you don't know they say on the internet so uh but yeah recently actually you might have heard of us because our parent company process have, have bought stack overflow and decreasing news so maybe we will also be uh more visible right now uh but Today it's uh, not really not really about business, but about data. And uh, to start talking about data intensive teams, I'd like to start uh, by by first trying to understand the term data intensive. And it was actually coined by uh, Martin Kleppmann like five, six, maybe already seven years ago, uh, when he wrote his amazing book uh, designing data intensive applications. Uh, highly recommended, but I mean, of course, uh, yeah, many of you have uh, probably already heard about it and doesn't need introduction. Uh, so he writes that an application is data intensive if data is its primary challenge, the quality, the complexity, the speed. So like basically everything around the data uh, is a challenge that uh, means that it's a data intensive application. And... Uh, uh, he in, the, in in his book he basically talks quite a lot about the history of uh, how we ended up with data intensive applications uh, from the technological point of view like quite quite a fascinating read but today like uh, zooming out a little bit and today really trying to understand and to debug these teams that are working on this data intensive application so if uh, an application is intensive if if it deals with data. That means that teams that are building this and running this data intensive application uh, and managing data products are the data intensive teams. And so, how do we cook these teams? How do we uh, deal with these teams? How do we uh, do like the best practices dealing with these data intensive applications in the teams to learn? how to do it, we actually need to also go a little bit back and to see the history of, of the development of uh, basically applications and data applications. And uh, going back like 40 years, uh, let's say I want to bring you to two seminal papers. Uh, on the left, in the left corner, uh, you see the Unix time sharing system, which is like a seminal uh, paper that introduced the Unix uh, system in 1974. Uh, on the right, you see System R, which actually introduced the first relational database that has influenced almost all of the existing relational and then non relational also databases and introduced so many concepts that were reused later on. And uh, it was introduced in 1976. But the interesting part is that it's actually like very, very similar. So basically both of them were information management systems uh, and they have like different approaches though. So for example, operation uh, operating systems viewed its role as uh, presenting hardware to pro computer programmers, while actually database management system, DBMS, viewed its role as managing data for application programmers. So taking a bit of a higher level of abstraction and then uh, dealing with all the complexity of the data and hiding it behind so that you can do the select star and then it will return the data to you while you will not need to manage pointers and, and just search uh, for the data in different places. And you can, you can say that uh, the Unix approach was more of a toolbox approach. So basically giving, the box of tools to developers so that they can uh, build things themselves while actually system r approach was more of a closed box approach uh, where uh, you, you you put something in a box and then you query to get the uh, result without uh, like doing too too much complexity on top of that so and and this 
worlds coexisted really, really well in this state. However, there was a kind of a dwelling wall between them uh, and, and these communities have developed maybe unnecessarily uh, far from each other. Uh, but yeah, it, it all coexisted well until the internet, until the internet happened. And this is a mosaic uh, browser, the beautiful uh, back then uh, browser now, now looks retro, of course. Uh, still, it was the first bird uh, that, that kind of trained people to desire more from the internet, to desire uh, images, to desire some fancy websites, to desire links. And, uh, and then this all, of course, was fine back in the mosaic era, but then internet started spread uh, and like a spread around the globe. And uh, finally, the, the poor box wasn't able to handle this anymore. So basically, uh, what was happening in the 90s and 2000s is that actually this box is like, as, as always, close box cannot be easily extended, right? So, but, but the good part of that is that actually, at the first time, these two communities of application developers and database developers were starting to come together. And so basically during these times, people started using tools to actually uh, decompose the box and introduce many, many uh, standardized and open tools. It, it brought the beginning of whole NoSQL, but then which converts to new SQL, like there is something really, really magical about the SQL language. Uh, so that all the new NoSQL databases are implementing SQL interfaces right now, but yeah, this is a different conversation. But it brought like a, this this really pieces of this box that we're doing one particular thing. Uh, for example, database internal transactional log was was brought into Kafka, and and this is uh, you can use with with all the many data sources right now. And uh, one of the benefits there was also. Uh, open source in the file formats, for example, Avro, Parky. These are right now industry standards as opposed to uh, like these closed systems of like Oracle, SQL Server that had their own proprietary uh, data standards. It, it wasn't easy to get data in and out. So basically, this is uh, what happened from the technological perspective. And I'm super pleased that that happened. Uh, and, and this kind of merge of these two paradigms happened and uh, application developers and database developers started working closer together. It didn't happen like a, uh, in a fairy tale, of course, there was lots of, hey, we're implementing uh, the, the flat tire approach and then all the all systems are useless. But then at the end, what we came up with is, is really great, great tool of technologies. But what was happening on the consumer side, which is, uh, also, also super interesting. You can see the Netflix website, for example, uh, 20 years ago on the left, and then right now on the right. And and you can see that actually, well, there were images before. Now you also see images, uh, but it's definitely it's, it couldn't be more different. But uh, like conceptually, not that unless you start looking into details, right? Uh, so you can see that all these tiles that you see here are actually ranked for you. Uh, and then you see the ranking by location, by your location where you are in right now. And then you also have this personalized lanes. And then in each of the lanes, you even have personalized images from the movie so that uh, Netflix finds the best match of the image for you for each of the movies. This is, this is insane. So, uh, where, where I'm heading here is that actually oh, every lane here, all the website here is is literally a data product. Like every piece of the website is a data product and somehow you need to uh, do it and you need to display it and to show to the user in a proper order. Uh, another example is Amazon. Amazon 20 years ago and Amazon 20 years, uh, Amazon of today uh, is, uh, is, is very different. And uh, you can see actually on the left uh, that Amazon of today has much less information 
like it, it has much bigger images, much more visuals. Well, you can say this is this is more fashionable or something. But then, on the other hand, for example, you don't even they don't even show your catalog, uh, like a, a categories that they have, because they now rely much more on search. And this is the thing. So, uh, like expectations, user expectations. If twenty years ago it was expected for you to to go to the website and then to to search for something to dig deeper into into the information right now it's it's not like that right now it's expected uh from you to to go to the website and see something that is relevant to you so you expect the site or the application the software product not to be only functional but actually to be very smart about what to show you what to display and imagine that netflix wouldn't show me uh like recommendations for myself but would show like i don't know uh their catalog in alphabetical order so this would be <laughs> a little bit uh, crazy same for amazon for example you enter and then you see like hey all the all the products alphabetically like yeah this this doesn't make sense it doesn't scale but then uh this this is what happened during this year so information abundance and uh, this is what we expect right now as users so that applications are actually smart and how do we build these smart applications? And uh, yeah, like usually, generally, uh, there are two things uh, that we need to consider, two kind of pain points here, is that usually they require larger development investment, which is obvious because, I mean, building data application itself is more uh, costly just because you need to manage data, you need to manage state. Uh, it, it's costlier to build stateful application rather than stateless, right? Uh, but then the second one is probably like even harder to tackle because uh, it brings uncertainty on this return on investment. And then uh, let me let me demonstrate it. Uh, so for for the cost, for example, this is this is uh, the data from the uh, Facebook paper uh, where they say that actually 80% of the AI inference cycles goes for recommendations. Right? So one single application of data uh, recommendations is taking 80% of inference cycles, which is like a, just you can think about this as cost for their AI investment goes for recommendations, which is quite crazy. It's, uh, it's a lot of money. Uh, but then uncertainty of results is, uh, is even trickier. Uh, and I have a very, very interesting use case from Bing here. Um, and uh, for example, on the left, uh, you can see the before and after of the Bing search. For example, you search for flowers and then uh, Bing is making money, of course, from showing the ads to you. And then you have some ads that are promoted on top. And then you see the description uh, on the first line uh, under the link. And then in the experiment, they actually decided to take this first line of description and put it into the link. Okay, so basically, uh, it's it's really hard to evaluate an idea like that. It seems like uh, it might bring some positive results. It might not. Like you never know. By by the way, this example is coming from an amazing book, uh, Trust Wars Inline Controlled Experiments. Uh, there is a link there, highly recommended. But so just guess for yourself. Uh, because we're all uh, online right now, just guess for yourself, like uh, how how much do you think this idea will bring uh, with with such a small front end change? And I will not keep you for long. This idea alone brought more than hundred million dollars per year to Bing, uh, which is crazy. Like it's uh, it's an insane amount of money. And of course, like Bing is a huge company and uh, uh, earns a lot of money. But but the thing is that it probably took a couple of days of development time to develop such an idea. And then the return on this investment was just staggering. And, uh, and if you think like that, uh, this, is, this is an idea that took two days to implement and, and brought a huge result. And then the, uh, the big, uh, for example, recommendation systems that are deployed on, at scale and require like machine learning platform and so on. So, so you don't want to go into any of the extremes here. You don't want to develop only fancy, complicated systems that are uh, built for, for ages, or you also don't want to do only the small changes. You want to go in both directions. And uh, if, you, if you go also on the 
source of truth uh, for <laughs> many of us, uh, which is Twitter. Uh, and you see like a, many of the much, much more important figures in tech are saying the, the same thing that it's really scary to spend uh, six to 12 months perfecting something and then uh, building the wrong thing. And then uh, Steven Sinovsky also says that, uh, that bringing goods to market is costly. But before now, like we, we didn't really know how much of that cost was trying to guess if it was the right thing uh, to build because the change was impossible. And now uh, we are actually in a phase where change is very much possible. So if you think about this typical development flow of like really, really zoomed out development flow, it has ideas and it has implementations, right? Uh, so you start with an idea, you, you implement something and then uh, like it either works or not. And uh, right now for, for this modern products, for this modern uh, applications, it, it really doesn't make much sense because here success doesn't depend only on the code quality, on the system quality. So basically it, your, your success of your idea doesn't depend on the quality of the implementation only. As you have seen uh, in, in the previous Bing example, it's, it's literally small ideas can have huge impact. And then it also optimizes for the wrong metrics that user is actually being uh, included into the loop very, very late. Right now, right now, I want you to pay attention because I'm bringing two of my friends here uh, to solve this problem. Basically, I'm bringing as a chameleon and an elephant, as a chameleon will represent the volatile uh, idea space, and then elephant will represent, of course, uh, implementation space. Uh, we start with this idea, and uh, we we decompose basically the idea into many steps. We start with the hypothesis uh, because it doesn't have certainty in it. Uh, the idea can be good, can be bad, implies judgment. You don't want to be an author of a bad idea. Right, but uh, also there are like different uh, ways to call it a user story, which which presumes that we know our users. And I highly recommend uh, the Twitter account about user stories. There is also a link there. Uh, it has lots of fun uh, uh, parodies on on user stories. So cool. Uh, we we take the hypothesis, and what do we do with the hypothesis? We try to build a prototype of it, and the, the kind of important thing here is that we always build it as fast as possible and we decompose to the minimum effort to test our assumptions. My favorite example is uh, Yandex Navigator which is kind of uh, analog of uh, Google Maps uh, in, in Russia. So you can see on the on left, person literally has a metal rod to which he puts stickies and then uh, he put his colleague in a car and then he started driving like, hey, and then whenever the time is right, he wants to test if some pop-up in the application will be useful for the user or not. And of course, of course, it's not uh, the same as, as building it into the code and displaying it on in the app, for sure not. But then to implement it, it into the code, it will take a couple of months and then to release it and then to uh, like see the user feedback, it will take at least like a three, four months, right in here, you can just take it in, in hours. And this is this is what we're aiming for. We are aiming for collecting the feedback. And, and this example is also great because you're, you're not only prototyping, you're also collecting the feedback from the person in real time by just driving with him. Uh, so, and this brings us to, to this next stage where we actually want to uh, go to the real world and collect this feedback. So basically, we don't want to build the prototype and then to, to, to productionize it. No, we want to launch an experiment with it. It can be A-B test, but then it can be also, as you just saw, saw in the previous example, uh, just, just testing it with your colleagues, with your friends, with your family. And the, the main idea is here is to avoid costly mistakes, right? Uh, like Because you're not developing something that is not going to fly from the very first test, uh, right? And then... Finally, we got to our elephant where we can go all in on the implementation once we collected all the data that we have before. And uh, yeah, like, or actually we can go for another hypothesis. And, and I'll, let me show you. Uh, for example, imagine that prototype or experiment has shown that, okay, it's not enough uh, 
a return on the investment uh, or like the prototype has shown that yeah the idea doesn't actually make much sense at all so we we just go and adjust our hypothesis so we don't need to go full production uh, and this is the beauty of uh, of uh, the system so that basically you can short circuit and you can see the potential savings are quite huge here and your time to value is maximized through that and actually it's even more because each of the following steps usually is bigger than the previous one so uh, you can potentially save even more and uh, like this is uh, you know like uh, the silicon valley jargon of hey like a uh, yeah you're not an entrepreneur and, until it failed and and this is taken up to extreme there of course but then there is something there right? because basically this lowers the variance of the outcome uh, because you're converging to a working solution faster you like you see something is not working you're not uh insisting on that you're trying different things and you're investing into something that is working so to recap chameleon uh to make him green have a constant flow hypothesis minimize investment into your first prototype collect feedback from real users and only invest into something that has proven uh its initial potential so chameleon is about moving fast right what's wrong with moving fast only right we can ask a, a person who knows a thing or two about moving fast and breaking things and uh, facebook's motto was actually move fast and break things but not many people know that a couple of years ago it was actually changed to move fast with stable infrastructure and uh, yeah if, if Turk is not a, a big of a figure for that for you i'm uh, uh, considering going into the football pitch and uh, let's let's learn uh, something from there. Uh, I want to refer one of my favorite coaches, uh, Thomas Tuchel. Uh, and and if you don't know who he is, let me just show you in a couple of slides. Okay, but uh, he's he's a famous football coach, and he just won uh, the Champions League with Chelsea. So, uh, but yeah, but uh, look here. So this is um, Mbappe. He is potentially the most expensive player in the world. He's a great attacker, uh, playing for uh, PSG and play, playing for France. Uh, great footballer. And this is Thomas Tuchel. So a person who is not afraid to do things like that to the most expensive footballer uh, is really worth listening to, at least. Uh, so the quote, we provide those attacking patterns and show them on video, but we don't practice them much. We almost exclusively concentrate on our defensive movements in training. So again, like this is at first when I when I heard it, read that, it didn't make much sense to me, but then it kind of really, really, really clicked because I translated it into, into our uh, work. So basically not to be afraid to experiment in attack exploring our new opportunities like going full chameleon you need to have your defense solved so basically infrastructure and ops needs to be stable and operational so that you can go and experiment and uh, and of course you still you still start with experimenting like you still start with something that makes sense you still start with exploration right um for example like if, if you imagine uh, or if you remember like this uh, Netflix example uh, from the above where we, we saw uh, the most popular movies in the location where I am. Uh, so it doesn't require a sophisticated machine learning model from the beginning, right? Start with a SQL query, but go through the full cycle, meaning get user feedback uh, and then like while you'll be implementing this, you'll learn so many uh, hacks that you you have to do. You'll learn so many components that are missing in your system. You'll learn so much about monitoring that needs to be added and and uh, tracking and things like uh, infrastructure, things like operations. You'll learn all of that by just implementing a simple SQL query, but getting the input and then putting the output to the user and collecting the feedback from them. You also know what's worth investment and what's not. Uh, and basically, 
when you are ready, like when you have something that is running and you've built a couple of applications like that, uh, think 10x, right? Uh, write your applications, write your system so that they can grow a one, uh, basically, uh, one, uh, uh, what, like 10 times that you can scale them. So 10 is a magical empirical number mentioned often in the industry. Uh, and then basically you want to build systems that survive this one magnitude of growth. Uh, and then when you're, it will take time to build the system. It will take time to build this foundational layer, but then you don't need to stop experimenting. At the same time, you can continue grasping this uh, low hanging fruits, experimenting with smaller things. And hopefully by the time that you implement your foundational layer, you have already things uh, that you have from your experimentation that will require your foundational layer to grow even more, right? So, and you're already invest into another order of magnitude of growth. And then again, like this all will come from real requirements, from real users that you'll be serving and you will not be building uh, something just because Facebook or, or Google has built it, you will not be building feature stores, you will not be building machine learning platforms. You will if you will need and if you will grow to that and hopefully you will, uh, but you will not start with that. You will not start implementing the whole system from the beginning, not knowing if it's good for your users, not somebody else's users, but your users. And hopefully uh, with this one, you can scale and scale and go uh, to the infinity and beyond. And uh, you can start reinventing yourself. You can uh, pivot when the time comes and you can learn to experiment and grasp uh, the easy leaves and also the uh, like build the great engineering systems. So to recap the elephant, uh, we have our infrastructure and operations as the most important things for the innovation. This is like a counterintuitive thought as, as an example from Thomas Tuchel, that you think about defense if you want to go to the attack. Uh, also build systems that survive at least to an order of magnitude of growth, because if you basically build more than you're wasting uh, the investment, if you build less, then you will need to rebuild uh, too often so that you don't want to do that. And then build only for your needs. And when those needs arise from your experimentation, from your iterations on the platform, from your learnings, from your software. And uh, with this one, thank you very much. I hope uh, these tactics can help you uh, to marry your chameleon and an elephant. And uh, let's keep the conversation. You can find me on Twitter or on LinkedIn or anywhere else. Thank you. Thank you so much for that, Elias. That was very interesting. Um, I really like your approach of just being experimental with uh, these kinds of um, changes that you want to bring about to your solutions to start the process of seeing what works and what doesn't. For a company that doesn't have, let's say, some baseline measurements or doesn't even know where to start uh, uh, in terms of what to measure, are there any kind of um, rules or best practices you might have? So let's say someone wants to start on this journey but doesn't know how to compare it as they start doing this type of prototyping. Um, do you have any kind of advice for how to formulate what kind of things that they should be looking for as they start this process? Yeah, that's, that's a great question. And uh, I think that the most important thing is not to, especially from the beginning, not to look into like uh, many other examples, but actually start from your uh, initial idea and from your uh, like desired point of where you want to be. And then like build things for yourself. Don't look at, at the state of the art. Don't look at uh, what's been built in, in big corporations. Like just, just start for yourself. Try to figure out things as you go, and then like, but but yeah, again, like don't don't uh, 
do it uh, for for developers for your own like put put it out for the user and collect their feedback and and, and from their own like incorporate this one uh, you can go forward like you you can yeah you can continuously iterate all day long but as long as you, you you're not bringing the users then your like iterations are worthless basically so like bring the user uh, learn from from the user uh, make your product better for your users because yeah honestly like you, you can have uh, very very different users with with Facebook with Amazon with with everybody else and uh, hopefully you do <laughs> that's a great point um, I have a follow-up question to that <laughs> which is um, how do you go about things uh, that are hard to measure so this is kind of a little off the path here, but coming from developer relations, that's kind of the biggest problem we have, right? Is how do you measure things that are meaningful or impactful? How do you measure things that are hard to measure? And I was wondering if you had any type of advice that uh, is in this realm, because I'm sure there's some things that as you're prototyping, you're like, well, how do we you know, accurately measure something that is hard to measure? Yeah, I think this is this is a great great question as well because straight to the point, we as as humans have a tendency of uh, like whenever we collect other test results or any data whatsoever, whenever the data is proven that we are good, we're like, hey, yeah, this is great. Whenever the data shows that something is bad, we're like, no, 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 we need to investigate that. This is like this is a super common bias where we uh, actually underestimate the potential <laughs> like flows in our uh, thinking so i think that the most important uh like in in this unmeasurable uh metrics is is to constantly try to challenge yourself constantly trying to see hey is it something to prove myself or actually to make something better for the users to make something better for the customers so really always asking this question and then not not stopping to ask this like basically collecting the feedback from the users uh incorporating the real feedback from uh like from forums from the applications from the internet uh just the fishing for this feedback not being uh not not trying to find the good feedback and just stopping on that you know but actually trying to fish for all the kind of diverse feedback from all the kind of diverse uh platforms and then yeah Wonderful. I, I agree with that. It's just it's very difficult when you apply these things to certain industries. And I completely agree with you about the, the bias, right? There's even the others where it's like, throw away the data if it doesn't agree with what you want it to say, right? <laughs> yeah, unfortunately. Uh, yeah. Well, let me just double check. And then, here. and then also, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, so uh, yeah, so basically, it's like, whenever you have some data, always, uh, Try to uh, try to yeah negate it like try to think like what what might have gone wrong when you when you were collecting it, not try to sell it first. That's a, that's also a really good point. Thanks for that. Um, I think we'll have a few more minutes. Um, if there's, I know you had some really good resources in your slides. Are there any other? pieces of um, resources, either books or websites that you may want to share if uh, people are interested in learning more, aside from the really good book recommendations you've already shown? Yeah, I think that I, I can share many, but related to this talk, <laughs> like a two, two books uh, that I was sharing there, like Trustworthy Online Experiments and uh, Data and Desk Applications, I think these are like very much related uh, to, to what I was talking about. So I'll share like the presentation later and, and there, there are links to these books there. Mm 